back for the third time of our series. Three is actually my favorite number, my lucky number, and I'm excited to be here again with Adam Atkinson, who is not just my coach, but a great friend and mentor to so many people. And if you guys haven't been watching our series so far, we've covered a lot of great topics, including disordered eating or not an elite dieter and meal plans versus macros. So that's all in the same playlist. If you guys want to check that out, make sure you go watch those. But for today, Adam, what are we talking about? So today we're going to try to figure out what your why is and why that is so important. Yes, absolutely. And from Adam's perspective, you know, working with, I'm, I'm sure you've probably worked with almost uh, what it has to be well over the tens of thousands of athletes. Would yeah, you say I'm so? Definitely. I've never really kept count, to be honest. I'm kind of a competitive person and I think I could get really, um, competitive with myself on doing more and more and more and uh, I think you know kind of the way I judge my success is you know how have I made people feel you know throughout the whole week by the end of the week you know are my connections strong you know do people feel they can access me um, do they feel open with me? Are they, you know, hiding things for me? You know, that's kind of a loss because I feel like I haven't put myself out there enough for them to feel that connection with me yet. And that may need that they need somebody else. But I feel like if they can really, you know, um, break down those barriers, be vulnerable and realize that everything kind of stays between us and they can tell me anything. And that that's one reason I like the Zoom calls. If people are constantly reminded by hearing other people's feedback, how that feedback is received, they're like, wow, that girl just binged and Adam didn't like tear her apart. He just encouraged her to get better. That encourages a lot of people. And sometimes that's where I get like the private messages right after the Zoom where they're like, hey, I need to open up with you about some stuff. Yes, that's something I notice as well with the clients I work with. When we do our group calls every month. It's not every day like you do, but every month we do this. Afterwards, I get people messaging me like, oh, when you brought up this, it made me think of all these things that they maybe didn't share on the call. But then every week, you know, they see someone else being super open about an experience they're having the next month that or every month. And then the next month they come on and they're sharing an experience that's more vulnerable. And that's that's because we're creating these communities where people feel they can be open because we both know too, from a coaching perspective, from a mentorship perspective, that if we're not being open about everything going on, we're going to be missing major parts to the whole. Absolutely. Tell so, me a little bit okay. about, I knew you have a process. I've worked with a few people that we've shared and uh, I know you have a process in finding the why. Um, do you want to touch on that a little bit? Yeah, I was literally going to ask you the same. I'll do it. Um, so by the way, you're on top of a pillow right now. So if I nod and I, um, it makes my whole body nod, so the computer's nodding. So you guys watching, forgive me for that. I'm traveling cross country for a move. So this is my desk right now. So Anyway, yes, so the core values process. So let me kind of explain why I do this first. So a lot of the times you'll hear it at every seminar you go to. You'll hear it with most of the coaches you speak with as well. And there's nothing wrong with this question, but I like to take it a bit deeper because the question is, what is your why, right? And when I hear that, I'm like, okay, it's good to know what your why is. It's important to have something that drives you. Generally speaking, it's better if it's an intrinsic motivator. Most of us have heard of the terms intrinsic or extrinsic motivators. We want to be in a position where we're being motivated from an intrinsic place. However, what I see with people's whys is it changes constantly. And when I say constantly, we're looking at a time frame between maybe every three to six or 12 months. That's a pretty short period of time, especially in an athlete's life who's trying to go far for a long period of time. So I started to wonder, you know, I was working with so many of these people. I'm like, why aren't like, why aren't people sticking through it? What is it that's keeping them from seeing that their their goal is worth pursuing consistently? So 
I remembered that when I was going through my business development, I decided to look at my core values. And what this did was it allowed me to start aligning every action I took with those core values. And that helped me to see that it was so much deeper than I just want to run this business. And the same thing applies for athletes. So when I'm working with a competitor, usually we've done a lot of decent, you know, base work together and I have an understanding of where they're at, but sometimes we just start with this. And when we start looking at what are your core values, those are the things that really drive you, the things that wake you up in the morning and sometimes keep you up at night. Like you're so excited about it. We peeled back all the layers of who you are. This would be left. Those are things like, you're going to think of keywords. So maybe that's freedom. These are mine, freedom, impact, love. Maybe there's faith. Maybe there's community. Uh, there could be exploration. We're looking at those big thematic words. And what we'll discover as I'm working with people is they'll say, I actually don't know how this goal aligns with this value. So I see this a lot when people have a value of family. They'll say, oh, I don't really think that my my goal of competing supports that of my family. So then what we do is we discover there's resistance to what they're doing. And we have to uncover how do we break that resistance. And the way we do that is see how this goal actually benefits your core value or see how your core value upholds and supports this goal. Then we create a really strong attachment to executing on this goal where it starts to feel like a non-negotiable versus I have a revenge body goal. And that's going to be an easy thing to convince yourself not to show up for. But when you say you have to ask yourself this question, what happens if I don't fill in the blank? So what happens if I don't meal prep? What happens if I don't go to the gym? Then we relate that back to your core values that we uncovered. If I don't go to the gym, I am sacrificing the value of my family because all I'm going to be thinking about while I'm spending time with them is about how I didn't go to the gym and that's going to put me into a ruminating cycle and then I won't be able to be fully present with them. So I got to go or I won't have the energy. I won't have my health for a long period of time. When you do that, it makes it a non-negotiable versus something that you can negotiate. So that's why I, instead of just asking, you know, what's your why, I take it a step further and say, well, what are your core values and how does that, how do your goals align with those values? And if they don't, what needs to change or what perspective might need to shift or beliefs need to be worked through to make sure that this goal, if it is important to you, Sometimes we find out they actually don't act, really want the goal. They just thought they should want it, but it aligns with none of their values. They no longer pursue it. That's okay too. So that's really the process that I'll take people through. Absolutely. And with that, you know, we should always focus on health in some capacity. And I have clients who go through that and they find out that this is not something they want to pursue, especially once they're in it and they find out how hard it is. But oftentimes, clients sometimes think they might be less important if they're not a competitive athlete anymore. And uh, that's actually one of the things that I really stand by on See You Later Leaners. Our lifestyle people still get the same tools that we would use for contest prep, whether they have a gut issue or they need some labs looked at. Um, we're still just as in the details and they're just as important. So, you know, tapping out on competing isn't failure, you know, still pursue some good lifestyle habits and you know, maybe you want to lose five more pounds from where you got in the contest prep and maybe losing 20 just isn't part of your why or what fuels you anymore. It doesn't mean that you completely have to quit. That's such a good point. It's like you can step away. I actually just spoke with a client on the phone yesterday, super into fitness for her whole life, started as a dancer, been in some really big magazines, done amazing work as a trainer. But, you know, through her contest prep, she felt a bit restricted. She felt like I can't do what I love with hiking or um, going and doing other sports and enjoying myself in that way because it's too dangerous. I can't go running for miles because I'm supposed to be doing this type of cardio. So when she takes a break from competing, you know, she feels this freedom to explore and do. But it doesn't mean she stops moving or she stops lifting or she stops training in any capacity. She still wants to push her body to a new level, but it 
just looks different. If she wants to go do yoga tomorrow, she does that. And if she wants to lift for three hours the next day in a CrossFit gym, she'll do that. But she's still moving and she still has goals. She, she thrives off of goals. So what we do is we find people's strengths and what they enjoy doing. And we can capitalize on that, whether they're competing or not. The, the goal should be fulfillment of not just, yes, your values, but also, as you said, your health and your physical needs and mental needs. Mm -hmm. I hear stories like that. And I'm like, man, that's where adaptive coaching really comes in. Because I hear this story. I'm like, I certainly could have worked around that with this client. And maybe they like the freedom of doing what they want to do when they want to do it. But there's no reason they couldn't have hiked for their cardio and stuff like that. You might just have to hike longer than what you would do if you're doing some really, you know, fast cardio or something like that. But if the terrain's well, you can hike faster too. So um, communication is sometimes key in these uh, instances. And maybe she felt like her coach was just super dogmatic and was afraid to ask, but, you know, um, kind of talking about this, you know, you, you should enjoy what you're doing to some extent. And I do think sometimes in prep, we're so dogmatic about how we're doing things. And, uh, you know, it does take more work on the coaches end, but it takes nothing to put a note like this person likes to hike and is active. Uh, I have a client who rock climbs right now. And, that has to pull from her training volumes in some degree. So we're kind of careful on her pull days. So, but I want her to enjoy her, you know, rock climbing and stuff like that. So we actually, once a month, we actually pull a back day for her to enjoy an additional day of rock climbing because we just know that's going to be great on her lats, tough on her biceps, tough on her grip. So she needs an additional rest day from training for that. And she loves that I set that up for her because it works, you know. That's so interesting. So I never thought I could ask you to like if I could go hiking and tell improvement seasons, but I think that's also like my own like I had my own story going on of like what I could or couldn't do. And then last year, this time, ironically, when I was staying with you guys and had the best experience, which we just, you know, reminisced on, I realized like other people on the team were going on walks and stuff. And you told me I could just go for a walk. And I was like, wait, this whole time I could have just been walking outside too. And you're like, yeah. And I'm like, damn, I've been in the gym at 3 a.m., you know, doing all this stuff. And I enjoyed it. Don't get me wrong. I definitely still enjoyed it. And for me, it made sense because I was able to track every piece of that data versus a hike where, you know, it wasn't as maybe predictable, uh, the treadmill or the elliptical that was more predictable and it felt good. And I got in my groove, but it opened my eyes that season opened my eyes. We're now like in this improvement season, I've I've messaged you like I played pickleball for 45 minutes or I went on a hike instead or we went kayaking for uh, the day and it was great and I tried this and that and like it's fun it's cool and that's something I actually really like about improvement season I like what you just said you use the term adaptive coaching which I've not heard that before but it sounds like that's a really great way to meet the client where they're at and make sure they're feeling satisfied through the process. Absolutely. Some of my best memories from prep weren't necessarily the training sessions, but uh, my very last prep, I had a goal of no machine cardio. So no rowing, no treadmills, no nothing. Um, I did live in Ohio at the time. So there were a few times weather affected that and I'd have to do like a row machine or I would choose sometimes a CrossFit wad or something like that. Wow. Um, I think I touched a cardio machine uh, three times during that prep, but the rest of the time I rollerbladed, uh, I did brisk walks or jogs. And, you know, sometimes just the sound of the pavement hitting my feet or rollerblading and just all the visions of the stuff I would see were very memorable and the mindset I would be in with being in different terrain or even just going longer on a trail that I'd hit a million times, you know, during that season as my cardio got longer to get further on that trail each time I did it was kind of a good 
goal of mine and it was really therapeutic and it was you know I know some people hate the cardio I would certainly hate doing it on a treadmill so I really tell people try to make your cardio enjoyable especially summer and spring comes around I tell people like it's warming up in your, your area as long as your area is safe like utilize it you know Totally. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I some of my best memories were trail running and my uh, 2020 prep, because there were no gyms open. So it was just running the trails constantly. And it was so gratifying. Like, it felt I unlocked a new version of myself. That was back when I was doing that kind of stuff for cardio. But it was just a really good experience. And now going back to your why I'm curious what you hear most often from your clients as far as like why they're reaching out to you to do a contest prep or to change their lifestyle yeah you know as I've graduated into higher level coaching you know there are people who want pro cards and that's one of the bigger reasons I think a lot of the whys I get are because my coaching style and my approach to it, you know, some girls want to use PEDs and they want someone who knows they're not going to carelessly virilize them and have education on the process. Uh, People want to compete, but they maybe had some health issues and they want to work with a coach who's a little bit more aware of those. So those are a lot of the whys I'm hearing now. I would say with my brand new competitors, I found this kind of um, just graduating college gap, it seems like, where for them, sports are gone. So this is now the new, you know, new curricular activity that they can do now that volleyball or basketball is over. This is something that they can compete in. And if they love the training and they love the competitiveness, the only difference is, yes, you're on a team, but it's very much an individual sport. So, you know, that's a shift. And then also shifting subjectivity versus you either make a basket or you don't. So that's part of what led me down the fitness path was I played team sports for so long and I thought, if I'm good without lifting in the gym or without watching my nutrition, how good could I be when I do that? Started doing that. But that led me to just fall in love with this lifestyle. And I let go of competing in volleyball. And it was such a great shift for me because I really was excited to have a sport that it was, everything was my responsibility. Because when you're playing volleyball and I was the setter as well as the libero, but you know, when you're the setter, you're running the plays, you're like the quarterback of the team. You could, you could play it. You put up the perfect play, right? The perfect set run. You could think you're making the best call and then it doesn't work out. And you're relying on other people also executing at their best, which is a really great team building tool. But after so many years, I was excited to just know that everything I put in at the gym, everything that I put into my body is going to reflect on that stage. And it's going to be on me. There was something about that that was so exciting. Plus, When you're an athlete in your past life, or or maybe you're not, but you're ready to move into a sport like bodybuilding, it still pulls out that athlete mentality in you. It still pulls out that competition mentality. So that type of driving why, like if someone presented it to me, like I want to do this because I don't have a sport to focus on anymore, or because I miss being an athlete, or because I want to know what that feels like, how far can I push myself, I would just take it a step further and really dig into well, okay, yeah, I understand that's not happening anymore in your life, but what does it bring you to do that? And giving people that extra questioning lets them think even deeper about it. So it's it's awesome to hear there's so many people who come because they see that you prioritize the health, right? So those are some of the key core values that they're probably identifying is you're prioritizing their health, you're prioritizing the fact that they want to enjoy their life, and you're willing to work with them where they're at. So they're probably really intrinsically motivated or, or valuing the fact that they get to pursue this while also not letting these other things fall to the side. 
Yeah. And one thing I want to put out there is competing is never really healthy. So, you know, that's pulling you out of the unhealthy phases of prep. Having a coach who knows how to do that is more important because there's a lot of people who are hearing what we're doing and some other coaches with, you know, working on people's health. But when you're prepping them, you're doing the opposite of that. So no matter what any coach says, I saw a girl post on, you know, two days out and hormonally healthy. It's like, no, you're not. Your coach is telling you that. But, you know, let's draw some labs and see what that looks like. Or you're just not lean enough and you're still healthy. So, you know, it's, yeah, um, yeah it's really indicative of what's, you know, where you're at in the process. I love that you can so um, honestly and in integrity share that because not a lot of coaches are actually willing to be like, it's really not healthy. Like you're, you're not starting a contest. Maybe you start a contest prep with the intention of being the best you've ever been. Right. But once you start, especially you get to that national level, you surpass a level of comfort where you're in pain, you know, like your body's in pain, you're mentally you know, drained and putting yourself into this. It's not a, what most would define as healthy. And then your body will change like how we talk about it in my prep uh, episode on confessions of bikini pro podcast, me and you talked about what my prep was like. We did a recap. If you guys want to check that out, you can, we talked about how Adam worked with me on my health pre during and post uh, competition season. So I think that's a great resource to refer to with what you're sharing but it's hard for people to admit that competing isn't healthy because, you know, people on the streets, they see a competitor on stage, just a stage shot. I want to look like that. It's like, yeah, you want to maybe, but like when you are off the stage, it doesn't look like that. Usually mm-hmm. we look kind of flat and maybe stringy. We haven't peaked and then we don't feel our best unless we're feeding into the show like you fed me into the show I started feeling really really much better and having the refeeds was helpful but yeah it's just the level of which you have to commit to get to that elite look and I'm not even the best I could be and that was still challenging and then you add in um boutique steps as you call them (laughs) and then it's a whole other ball game Mm -hmm. kind of what happens behind the scenes and I'm always as honest with people as I can be but you know honestly I have clients who are on PEDs but I'm not necessarily going to throw that out there unless I know they're extremely open about it because I want everyone else's business to be private and since it is technically illegal it is one of those things that uh, you know a lot of people don't want people to know that they're doing it. And uh, I think if more people came forward, especially women, because with men, it's almost bragging rights about what they're using and how much they're using and how often they're using it. And with women, it does seem really, um, you know, really uh, hush hush or, you know, they're just like I'm only on a little big clan or something like I was thinking of like you talk to a woman you ask her if she's natty knowing she's not she's like well it depends how you define natty you're like well like if you're taking anna or if you're taking clan you're not clan some people consider clan as a still making you natty I'm like what's it twin and how (laughs) well someone had sent me a post the other day um because someone was defending someone's um, it was like someone's defending like a, a voice change on a competitor and they had said that TRT will virilize people and I'm like not if you're doing true TRT <laughs> like it yeah it, and I think we're really misinformed on what you know because some people do TRT but it is not TRT it's way above and I think when you look at what TRT is that should be replacing your natural well it should be replacing your endogenous hormones so for women you should be you know no higher than like 70 depending on like what lab test you're getting that is true TRT if you go over that 
you probably might virilize, but you shouldn't virilize on true TRT. And uh, one of my clients asked me like, well, I'm on TRT. Are we going to virilize? <laughs> I was like, no. I said, this is just false information. And uh, you just... That's the thing. There's a lot of people speaking on it that don't know much about it, but they're defending the protocols they're putting out there that aren't necessarily helping women. And I tell people when you hire a coach, look at their competitors' faces, listen to their competitors' voices. And those are the stuff that coaches ain't putting out there right now, you know? So true. And um, kind of back to your point about the health as well. I remember during our prep when we were really, really pushing it. I, I don't know if you remember, I emailed you. I said, is this like what's healthier or what's more unhealthy pushing the way we're pushing or someone taking drugs? Because as a natural athlete, it's like, and I have to work really hard to get lean. I was like having to push my body to extreme limits. And then I'm thinking about, is this just as bad as someone who's taking any extra help and you explain to me you're like there's gonna be risks to each but actually you can mitigate the risk quite a bit with enhancements um and even though that's not a route that we went or probably ever will go at least from what I've shared with you I don't ever want to but I know that some other people are, are probably out there wondering like is it actually just healthier for my body physically to go the enhance route than to be pushing myself to this level. And I was hoping you might touch on that. Yeah. You know, I'm really happy where this is going because this does fall into our why still. Um, I know we you can just talk about it. off topic. You know, when you're hiring a coach, this stuff is really important. So, you know, do you want to have kids at some point in time? Yes, there are fertility risk with enhancement potentially, but we can use certain things that are going to minimize that risk. Um, so this is where I truly think being a good coach and somebody who just gives protocols where the rubber really meets the road, because I just had a conversation with a client who I just knew did not want children and she wants to take her bodybuilding to the next level. And I said, I wanted to have this conversation with you because I know how far you want to take this. I also know you want to remain feminine, but I also want to make sure I'm not just assuming. So do you want to have children? And she's like, I actually don't. And I don't even think I can because uh, she had some operations that the doctor said it would be very unlikely unless she tried within the next year. And that year has already passed. So we decided we're going to do a TRT replacement for her um, to start off. And, um, you know, this is going to be amazing for her. And it's a very unique setup. And that might be different than the next 10 women that call me that want to enhance in a particular way. So, you know, not just giving everyone one thing, even though there's some similarities, what phase they are in prep even matters. So, yeah, this comes down to your why. How far do you want to take this? You know, I don't want a bunch of women who have worked with me, did one contest and only know how to get lean by taking Clen and Anovar. And then also how important is your femininity too? Uh, you know, do we want to risk virilization? So this is where I'll always defend myself, where would you rather take three or four compounds and not virilize or take one at a really high dose? Mm -hmm. And does that make me a bad coach putting someone on four compounds to keep femininity? I don't think so. But someone looking in is going to say that's way too much stuff. I can't believe that. You know, but someone who's taking one compound at 25 milligrams a day, which is a super dumb idea for a female, you know, they look like the good guy because for now, because their coach only put them on one thing. And, you know, you say Anavar, everyone's eyes get big and say, yes, that must be correct because everyone's using just that. And it's like, well, we, 
you know, a couple weeks and see what happens to this person's face, voice, or maybe even things you can't see. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> um, and, and I love educating people on this because you can create synergy with compounds versus just using the androgenic pathway for growth, you know, and that's where it's going to be very risky on virilization. So for those who don't know what virilization is, and you had referenced certain, you know, traits to look out for, but can you explain virilization? Yeah, so voice deepening, facial structure changes, clitoral enlargement, you might even get odd hair growth in places, you know, and that can even happen if you have a hormonal, you know, disorder like PCOS or something like that. So if you take a bunch of androgens on top of that, it might get even worse. So yeah, and there's also things like that you want to watch as a coach, like voice pitch analyzers, when maybe androgen doses do get a little bit higher than what your starting point is like let's check these things and not just assume they're going to be okay because I had 10 other clients do this successfully because you might be the one who doesn't do it successfully so typically anything over 10 milligrams for my girls is usually when I start having them watch that and that's if they decide they want to push that hard you know so which I usually advise against but if we do let's go ahead and take some extra steps and measures because everyone kind of seems to be like you know what it'll be fine for me it's always fine until it's not <laughs> you know so um you know I I don't want a bunch of girls out there who are uh, regretting their competition you know um choices yeah, and you know, from like a, a psychological perspective, something that's always fascinated me is like the patterns of addiction as well. You start to see your body change in such a way and maybe you're getting rewarded with a particular result for making that change. And then you want to see what else, what else, what else. But when you need to take a break and reset, it can feel very difficult for athletes to see them their body go back to maybe a more a less enhanced look even if they still look amazing because of everything they've done and achieved it's hard for them mentally to adjust and then I think it can become addictive for some to be like oh if that did this what could a little bit more or more compounds or more help do to support me and it can create this cycle of like now I, I forget completely my why, I forget completely my values because I've become addicted to the way this looks, the way this feels and the way I've been rewarded for it. And I, I, I could be talking out my, you know what, thinking this, but I, I know this is something that happens. Is this something you've had to talk clients through where you're almost talking them off the ledge of like, hey, you know, let's pull back a little bit. I know you're getting where you want to go, but if we push much further, we could actually be detrimental to the long term. Yeah. You know, it, it even happens with supplements. I had a client last week and she's, you know, we've really had a hard time losing and she has like 30 different vitamins that she is taking. And when progress slowed down, I said, I think we really need a reset. We really need to hit the reset button. But this is hard. You're taking all of these things and you were thinking they are doing something. And I, I agree. If I, if someone told me to pull me off of all of my supplements, I'd be a little bit hesitant to do it. So I agreed that this is going to be hard, but she was willing to do it. But it was almost a perfect example of a psychological supplement addiction. Uh, and I told her, I said, I'd even have to look up what some of this stuff is because I didn't even know. So there could just be interactions with some of these that just aren't, aren't great. And uh, I don't know everything, but I said, I surely don't think you need to take all of this. And I also said, you could hire like three of me for the, the price <laughs> you're paying for these supplements, you know? For real. Can't that have a negative effect too, physically, like on your brain, if you overtake supplements that you don't need or vitamins you don't need? 
Yeah, I mean, there's going to be things that you store more of and you don't want to store, you know, too much of certain things. Like you you certainly don't want to take a bunch of iron and not know like where your iron levels are at, right? So, um, or even like people will overdose on fish oil to like hit their fats. That's a really common thing. You definitely oh. don't want that to happen. Yeah, so um yeah, you definitely have to be careful with those things. And I was so happy she was glad to pull things back because I'm so used to clients not wanting to do that. Yeah, no, that's that's I'm glad you had that example, too, because I I see it. We see exercise addiction. We see nutritional types of addictions. And then we see the addiction to competing the body as well, just the physical look. There's so many things that we can put in place physically to reduce or maybe um, create a risk factor reduction anyways, and psychologically as well. So it's so important for athletes when making any decision, even when me and you talk and I'm natural, like, and you respect that. And like, there's no hesitation, but yet I'll still ask you questions about certain things and you answer them because we have a working relationship where you understand where I'm coming from and what my needs are. And you brought up a good point. If someone wants to have kids, right? Maybe that's part of their why. They want to have a family. They want to create um, a legacy in that way. And so maybe their path isn't going to look the same as someone who doesn't want that in bodybuilding. And both are fine, but you have to be respectful of what you really want and know that your worth as a person, as an athlete, is not less because you decided to go a different route than someone else regardless of what that route is we need to capitalize on the fulfilling empowering experience and this might be a controversial question so I don't want you to feel like you have to answer this at all but a lot of people I speak with are surprised with how many bikini girls are actually not natural um especially today they'll get it's like shocking when you find out how many aren't how do you approach it when a client comes to you and they say you know I want to be at this level but I want to be natural and I want to do it in the NPC and the IFBB like do you have a perspective or viewpoint or maybe an opinion on if those things are even possible with the way it is now yeah, I'm glad you asked that because I was kind of thinking about taking it there because just like in our situation, you know, we just have to optimize other things, you know, dig into digestion, like let's make sure that that is going well. And I don't think, you know, a lot of other coaches would do that, you know, with you. And we just have to make sure everything else is that much on point, not necessarily to an addictive mentality but we want to make sure that the overall function of the body is as good as it could be so we're really obviously looking forward to our next prep because this is our first off season together we have found some things where we're going to be able to optimize your health a little bit better and I think these are things that you may have had you know before we started working together and we're in a prep so optimization is key and then encouraging clients that it might take longer and it really does depend on your genetics. And I always tell people, if you're not going to use, we can't let people be non stuff be the excuse of us, you know, losing or not. That's our choice. So we can't use it to kind of hold ourselves back. And, uh, I think people can do that because sometimes I'll hear some natural people say, well, I just did nationals. I was six and I'm sure all the girls that beat me were on stuff. And it's like, well, we still have the ability to do that. Just like a NASCAR driver has the ability to put all the parts on the car that they're allowed to put on. They have engine regulations and they're not allowed to go under over that. They certainly could go under 
but no one is. But if you're choosing to drive with a little bit smaller engine, we can't use that. You better be able to drive really great and um, be a very skilled driver. So we had to have a really skilled athlete, a really fine tuned machine at that point, if we're going to have a little bit of a smaller engine, but we can still be competitive and we can still make it fun and we can still enjoy our own personal growth through the process. And I think where we really lose is there's these people out there on social media that are like the second place is last place mentality. And it's like, well, to you, it is an awesome, <laughs> you know, yeah. like must really suck working with you because all your athletes fail if they apparently don't win. And that must really suck to work with a coach like that. You know, I honestly, I hate to see coaches like that out there, to be honest, because there are a lot more things to this journey than winning. And yeah, I'm obviously not the most winning coach in the game, but you know what? I spend my time on what matters with my athletes. And I don't think a bunch of my athletes are going to hate me after working with me through the process, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And you've had success with so many different types of athletes as well. I know that I can come to you in any season or phase of life that I'm in and I can be successful. I've gotten to a point where I feel like, oh, like I can go pro after I have kids if I want to, or I can extend my improvement season like we're doing now and prep later in 2024 instead of start prep now and then go for it all again. It's like, I'm seeing this deep, um, acceptance come through me because I know I have your support of like no matter what we're going for we know what we're working towards it's just a matter of giving ourselves the time to get there and so having that belief and having that support and that time frame too it just allows you to develop into an athlete that can sustain what's necessary and actually build the efficacy needed to continue to make the changes and take the steps that are required to get the results you want yeah. People are so judgy, man. Like, uh, you know, it's funny because I'll get someone who wins it in masters, you know, they get a pro card masters and then someone will be like, yeah, but they got it in masters. It's like, yeah, they got it in the division that they qualify for. So like, you know, like it, it's so funny because I think we're the only industry that's this negative. Like when my dad ran marathons, like no one hated on my dad's wins when he won in his, you know, 50 and older age group, people would be like, congratulations. Like, how'd you get your times to that? Like, but in bodybuilding or like, yeah, they wanted in masters. I'm like, well, like <laughs> masters people matter too. Honestly, they're a lot of fun to work with. And I, you know, I, I love working with people like Janine and, you know, um, my client Amanda is amazing. Um, you, there's I'm gonna forget to name names oh, there's yeah. so many great there's masters so competitors you know when I moved to Vegas Jen Woody is a, a master's competitor who lives in Vegas she's been like a mom to me like she was like mm -hmm. if you need me to come and look at anything when you're closing <laughs> like let me know you know super helpful you know and not that my open girls wouldn't do that but there's just uh you Different. you with the masters you kind of know a little bit more of what you're going to get into from a mindset perspective and a why perspective which makes the process a little more enjoyable sometimes absolutely and you know what I think sometimes that feeling of judgment or maybe hierarchy within the sport like I will say this sport is so supportive as well like the community but there is that judgment that you brought up I think it's because this sport attracts as well as breeds people with a top 1% mentality. So they want to be the best. They want to be at the top. They want to be the champion. They see themselves as different than everyone else, which is good, right? Because it's gotten them where they are or it's taking them where they want to be. At the same time, it can kind of create that. Um, what's a good phrase for it? It's, I'm not trying to be offensive because it's not an offensive phrase, but just people create this mentality of like, I'm better than because I can do the things that most of the people in this world cannot do, right? Diet, 
and also gain and diet again and be fine. So we're capable of doing this repeatedly. So I think that it already attracts this top 1% mentality folk. And then you bring into that, like now we're all competing against each other. We need other hierarchies and every system that exists in the world has some sort of hierarchical structure because it's the way that we think and the way that we behave. Unfortunately, sometimes I think it's expressed in a way that feels unsupportive. Like you said, oh, you went pro in masters or, oh, well, that's a masters competitor. It's like, um, we just had the masters Olympia. Jess Wilson won it, right? So she won the bikini division. She also was what top six in the Olympia last year. Open. Hello. Yeah. And most of the people, let's be real. So many of these open competitors, we look at someone like Erin Stern. She would be master. So are you going to tell her that she's, well, she's a master's pro. So she, she turned pro and I'm pretty sure open, but like, just cause she's master's age now, you wouldn't say that to her. So I think it's unfortunate that there's that judgment. Same thing with teen or the younger divisions. Well, she only won that class because she's young and there were only a couple people. She won the class. So that's bodybuilding. You don't know who's going to show up. You, you're apply, You're going into the division. Maybe you're enhancing your chances by going in many divisions. But if you want something bad enough, you will make sure you give yourself the best opportunity to get that. And just because you go pro in one division or you win in one class doesn't mean you're not able to be successful in others. It's just that was your door you open and walk through to to enlighten the path everywhere else you want to go. Yeah, it's really important in the sport to stay away from negativity because um, it will pull you in very, very quickly. So definitely make sure you stay on the positive uh you know, people, news feeds. And by the way, Jessica did end up winning. It must have yeah. just happened. Not it long just ago. happened. I, I, I was looking at it this morning. I was showing Sean. I was like, I think Jess has it. Like this, the girls, the, these women looked amazing. I didn't know who I think was second and third. I couldn't recognize them. But the, sec the other girl, I saw her page and I was like, dang. She looks phenomenal. I was like, but Jess has it. Like, I just know she has it. The girl looked really good from the front, but just judging by everything I saw, I think I was like, it's got to be Jess. And then it got announced literally right before we started recording. I sent it to Sean. I was like, she's going to win. <laughs> and I That's love awesome. Jess. I'm partial because she's such a Same. great person and friend. <laughs> I did a seminar. I did peak week seminar with her combined with a booty band workout. Um, you know, she was working with Kim, has worked with Kim for a long time, but uh, we collaborated with Toxic Angels to do a seminar together back in like, maybe like 2013 or 14 wow. during the Arnold. Yeah. So I've yeah. always been connected with her and she's always been so helpful. Like she helped Laura, like with a suit color and was like holding it up on her and like super helpful. So she's always a pleasure. It's good to see good people win like that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And we like on the subject of focusing on the positives, when you align yourself and you surround yourself with positive people, you can't help but to feel a deep sense of gratitude as well as positivity and excitement. Like you see sportsmanship on stage, right? Like women making sure someone's hair looks good went for their you know overall photo or giving them a hug as they walk off stage like that's good sportsmanship and and celebrating the winner when you're going into a show um or coming out of a show celebrating the winner or you're going into a show and you're acknowledging how great these people look we all want to be better the best way for us to get better is to make sure the people we're competing with are at their best too that's how we create a better version of ourselves. Cause we're not saying I want to walk in a room where everyone's bringing a subpar version of themselves. We're saying, I want to walk in the room with the best of the best of the best. And then I want to win knowing I won because everyone brought their best and I was deemed the person who was going to take it. Or I want to know that I lost not because I didn't bring my best, but because I brought my best and someone better is still there and I'm going to get better because of it. It's perspective. Yeah, I was really lucky in high school. Uh, I pole vaulted against the state champion who was actually my best friend. So we Aww. went one and two like all year long up until the state meet, you know, and uh, cool. I always had him to chase though. So I always thanked Robbie for being such a good vaulter because 
I I'm like, I would like to beat you. And he wanted to see me beat him because he I was actually a, a year older than him. And he's like, you know, I can win the save me the next <laughs> year. This is your year to do it. And Aww. I'm like, you're like a foot and a half above me, you know, but uh, it was so cool to have that companionship. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't want anything but the best for him and same. Yep. And to experience that at such a young age, I think really helped propel me into this sport and with how I worked with my athletes. Yeah, absolutely. Like you helped to encourage so many of your athletes. You've been there, so you understand how it you understand how it feels to come second multiple times or to come so close multiple times. And that's sometimes a hard pill to swallow as an athlete. But then when you look back and you reflect and you're like, that made me better. And that allowed me to then show up different, train different, perform different. Like I remember playing volleyball. I'm like, when you're first string, you know, you don't want anyone to take your spot. So you're working twice as hard just to protect your first string spot but what you notice is every teammate gets better so now you're not just working twice as hard to protect your spot as a first string athlete but you're also encouraging every other person on your team to grow because you want you want them to beat you out of your spot because it means the whole team got better you know the whole saying like you're only as strong as your weakest link it's like that's that's a good point and we want our we want a bodybuilding federation we want a, a class we want the women we're standing next to or the men we're standing next to to be so competitive that we know wow I really am like standing up here with the best and that's an encouraging feeling versus like you said you can't make an excuse if you're natural and you decide to compete in a league that's not testing for that you can't make that excuse that hey well they're all on this it's like yeah but you chose to be there and that that should be seen as a really great opportunity versus a limiting factor. Absolutely. And it's important to make your athletes feel important. I had a client just say, I can't believe you shared me on your story. I'm like, we share everyone on our stories. We're proud of everybody. And also to divide what people might think is favoritism. Um, You know, there's some people who live near me, you know, so you might see them, you know, do a filmed workout with me a little bit more often than others. But everyone has that opportunity. We film everyone when they come in to train if we can and or even if they want to, you know, so there's that as well. But also, I do like to explain how sometimes pro-level coaching, we're not necessarily always focusing on how to hit your macros because they know how to do that. So are we focusing on different things? Yes, but that's because we're not really focusing on some other things because we already have that down. So the direction just shifts and the importance on other things matter versus what you might work on with an amateur. So kind of explaining to athletes, you know, why you do this with a certain athlete. And that's, again, adaptive coaching. So Mm. this is, uh, you know, kind of goes into our, um, you know, whole umbrella of what we've been speaking about today. Yeah, that's such a great point. And I'm glad that you brought that up. I'm honestly really happy with the direction of this. I feel like we didn't just touch on you know, why and core values, but we touched on, and obviously we got into deeper subjects that connect to that. But when I'm thinking back on this conversation, I'm like, seems like we really discussed fostering a champion mentality for yourself, as well as complementing that with the actions you choose to take in accordance to your why, in accordance to your values, and in accordance to what you want to see happen for yourself personally and how you develop as you said you experienced in your own athletic background as well and then also professionally through this sport or in other areas of your life yeah if your why is just to win you're probably going to lose you know right I think we kind of define that as we go so it is important to find a lot of other things with this absolutely you know we have to have like a bonus mentality everything is a bonus on top of this like It is a blessing to pursue this lifestyle. It's a blessing to compete in this. It is a blessing to be able to provide ourselves this opportunity to do this and pursue this type of goal. The body is a bonus. The trophy is a bonus. Everything's a bonus 
is the cherry on top to something already so amazing and fulfilling. And that I think fosters a sustainable approach and mentality above just doing whatever it takes to win uh, incredible, maybe doses or extreme uh, efforts in your preps and improvement seasons that aren't going to help help you be healthy long term. Um, yeah, but that might get you there fast, but it won't get you very far. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, anything else to add to this? I think we nailed this one. So, as so always, too. right? <laughs> exactly. As always, we're our own hype. But you know what? Thank you guys so much for listening and for commenting on our YouTubes, as well as reaching out to us via Instagram or any other social platforms. I even got an email. So thank you guys so much for just letting us know how much you're enjoying this. We have a lot of resources. Adam posts great stuff on his Instagram. I do as well. We have extra resources. Your website, see you later, leaner.com, right? Yes. So just see you later, leaner.com, or you can go to Instagram and just do at see you later, leaner. Perfect. Yeah. And mine's celestial.fit. Got a ton of free resources there or at celestial underscore fit on Instagram, but we will catch you guys. I think we're going to do like one or two more of these. Uh, we'll just keep flowing with it. So Keep giving us feedback. We appreciate it. And thank you, Adam, again for doing this with me. You're welcome. All right. Bye, guys.